We're grateful for the beautiful world we live in, the opportunities we have to enjoy the creation that you've made for us. Although there are many things about life and about ourselves that we don't understand, we're grateful for your majesty, for the creation that you've made of us and for us. We pray that you will bless us as we go through this day. Thank you for the coming of the Lord's Day, the opportunity for us to gather and worship and the blessing that is in our lives. We pray that you'll be with us today in the activities that we're involved in, the special place that it is today as we uh, add elders to our existing eldership. We pray that you will bless our elders as they lead this congregation and that we will be blessed because of their life and efforts. Father, we thank you for the church at Maysville, the church the world over. We ask that you'll help us as we go through each day to live faithfully as your children, to live as you would have us to live. Watch over us and forgive us of our sins. Go with us through this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 2. Um, I have marked <clears throat> for us to begin in verse 4. Um, we have spent a little time on this material already, but um, we're going to come back to chapter 2, verse 1, and, and tie in so that we can make the connection of what's going on, and then we will um, begin our discussion in verse 4. If you recall, uh, I gave you some homework uh, last week, and I'm prepared for you to turn your sheets in now. <clears throat> I should have assigned at least a, a page or two of, uh, of a report uh, just to see how things were, were progressing in your studies, but anyway. All right, chapter 2, verse 1. Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. 14 years after what? Verse 18 of chapter 1 says, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. Three years after what? First trip to Jerusalem. I would assume that it's his conversion and uh, his interaction with the church there and when he was uh, left from Jerusalem uh, to go back to his place in Tarsus. Um, and the, I don't think that it's 17 years by the time we get to chapter 2. I think the three years is the three years cumulative and then 14 years total. But I wouldn't <coughs> be dogmatic about, dogmatic about that. Uh, but that appears to be uh, what I think is the case. If that is the case, then the activity in uh, Acts chapter 15 uh, would have occurred some 14 years or so after uh, the conversion of Paul, which gives us a helpful timeline because there's no, there's no markers there for us to use to identify the concept of time passing. So if, if Paul was converted in Acts chapter 9 and the event that he's talking about here is Acts 15, which I think it is, uh, there are some who did uh, doubt that, but I think this is Acts 15 that's going to be described here um, as, as this gathering of Paul with the uh, apostles and, and elders privately. Um, then we have a window there of about 14 years between Acts 9 and Acts 15. If you were reading that material, and when we're reading of that material as students of the book of Acts, it probably does not seem like there's that much time going on, but that's likely the case. But we go on. I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. 
But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows no personal favoritism to no man. Excuse me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me for the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Pause there. Now that's a lot. There's a lot of stuff there. And uh, I want for us to, if we can, parse it down this morning um, so that we don't come back to that spot again uh, next week. There's a lot of material in the book of Galatians. Now, it is possible to run past a lot of things and only mm -hmm. give it a brief observation or comment, and you can skip over a lot. Well, you know, that, that does not tend to be my path uh, along the teaching route. I'm going to open up the boxes and kick over the rocks and look underneath. And so um, when we finish studying Galatians, you've, you've got some of the uh, understanding of the material that's here. Now, let's, let's put these statements that Paul makes, and he makes a list of statements into uh, proper just, uh, order and distinction and uh, spend a little time with this. The facts that Paul makes, and starting in chapter two, 2, verse 1, after 14 years, well, we've discussed that already, and I believe that that probably is the description of from his time of conversion and the events that occur in Acts chapter 9, where uh, Paul is meeting with the uh, church in Jerusalem with the aid of Barnabas, uh, but he's not there for very long. So this is, uh, I believe, that event. Um, number two, uh, who, who's involved in this gathering? Well, Barnabas and Paul and Titus. Now, in Acts 15, is Titus mentioned? I'll save you some looking. No, he's not. Okay, does that mean that Acts 15 is not the, uh, the event because Titus isn't mentioned there? No. Why would Titus be mentioned in Acts 15? That's not the focus of what's taking place there. There would be no reason for, Paul, for Titus' name to come up there. Now, Titus probably was not in the meeting where Paul and Barnabas met with these brethren. Maybe he was, but I doubt that he was. I suspect that though Titus made the journey, um, he was not Exhibit A in Paul's discussion with the, uh, with the folks. Hey, I've got here, by the way, this, uh, this Greek man uh, who has not been circumcised. Uh, but as a Christian, I doubt if that was the case. Uh, could it be the case that Luke didn't mention it, but Titus was there? Absolutely. One of the there are some pithy phrases that will serve you well in a variety of situations. Fly into the crash as far as you can. That's a good one. <clears throat> um, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. The fact that Paul does or that Titus is not mentioned in Acts 15 does not mean Titus was not there. The fact that they cannot find Moses' name written in Egypt on some monolith or on a pyramid does not mean Moses wasn't there. That's some of the, the uh, rhetoric that the skeptics use. Well, you know, if Moses was this big guy down here. Joseph was so important. Why don't we have their names written on, on these places? There'd be no reason to. Uh, they didn't play prominently in Egyptian history. They played prominently in Hebrew history. Uh, so we wouldn't expect to find anything down there regarding them, especially not Moses. Some of the Egyptians uh, marked out to people they didn't like. Uh, so, you know, if, if Moses' name had been on some place, they would, they would have struck it out. Uh, he would have been perceived as a traitor. And uh, they, they tried to sterilize their history, unlike some other uh, cultures. Uh, but no, we wouldn't expect to, to find that. So the fact that Titus is not mentioned 
makes no difference whatsoever. Paul is mentioning Titus here only for the reason that Paul was associated with a Greek man who was a uh, minister of the gospel, who was going to be preaching, who was Greek, and he was not circumcised. And now him using it in this context, does that mean that the, that the group saw Titus and didn't object to him? Now, that argument could be made, but again, we, we don't have it. It's, it's, there's, a, there's a blank there, so it'd be con uh, conjectural. Okay, verse 2, I went up by revelation. What does that mean? Paul says, I was told to go. Uh, now, how was he told? Was it an angel? Was it a dream? Did God speak to him? Uh, while he was walking down the road? We don't know. All Paul says is, I didn't go by myself. I was instructed to go up and make contact here. Okay, so it's by revelation. And communicated to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. All right, so Paul says, I went up and told them what I'm doing. This is what I do. But he went up, uh, whatever number we are on our facts list, privately, rather than uh, a public deal. It wasn't a, a public... Uh, thing in the church it, it didn't cause trouble it was done privately so that the problem could be solved uh, this was not an attempt to bring attention to it this was an attempt to tamp down an issue that had risen up in the church now would Paul meeting with the elders and the apostles in Jerusalem qualify as a private meeting You can do all your cat noises you want, Pat. The answer is going to be yes. It's still a private meeting. Now, private in the sense it is a one-on-one? -on -one? No. Private in the sense that it was... Uh, how many elders were in the church in Jerusalem? We have no idea. Uh, more than two. That's all we know. Uh, more than one. That's all we know. Because it's elders, so it's plural. Um, we don't know. Could it have been 20? 50? conceivably how many Christians were in the church in Jerusalem prior to the dispersion by Acts 15 how many Christians could have been in the Thousands church in Jerusalem oh it could have easily been 50,000 people uh, there in the church uh, they had 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. And then go forward and it says multitudes and multitudes of multitudes and more believers were added. So yes, you could have had a very significant group there. So could the eldership at that time have been a significant number of men? Yeah, could have. Very likely could have. But still, it's a private meeting in the sense that this was not in front of the church. It was not done for... Uh, um, everyone to know about. It was a private meeting uh, with those who had uh, importance or um, influence is good, uh, standing, um, at any rate. The, the one thing I will put, add here to, in, in Titus in verse 3 <coughs> Not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Compelled by whom? And we know Paul didn't compel him. I think the elders were pushing it possibly. I don't think if the elders weighed in on this topic that they did push it. I think there was a recognition. I think Paul is using Titus for the fact that uh, that nobody pushed this on Titus. This this was not something that was pushed on Titus, even in that that setting. So, could Titus have been in this group? Could he have been example A by the Apostle Paul? Yeah, it could have. Don't push too hard. When we when we do Bible study, um, it's like handling very fragile. Um, material or something that it can very easily be pushed out of place or, or harmed. Be gentle. Don't, don't try to push it into the mold you want. See what's there and, uh, and delicately deal with it. Here we have Paul making a statement about, temp about Titus. Why does he bring him up? Well, because Titus was a Greek, a known Greek, uh, converted, and he wasn't circumcised. Well, why does he bring him up here? Well, Paul took him along. 
Did he take him along in the meeting? Could have been. Uh, was this part of the conversation? It might have been. It says if Paul wouldn't, didn't compel him, who would have compelled him? Paul wasn't going to compel him to be circumcised. He could have been well, saying that they had the meeting, and even though they knew Titus was there and his was not circumcised, that they didn't even say, didn't bring it up to him. Could have. There, there are lots of options, and any one of them that don't conflict with another statement is, could be a valid option. Was Paul a hypocrite? Was, um, was his behavior regarding circumcision hypocritical? Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. All right, what is Timothy? Is Timothy a Christian? Yes. He's a disciple under a believing mother. If he's not a Christian, I don't know what you're going to do with those words. So yes, Paul, uh, Timothy is a, is a, a, a Christian. Verse 2, he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Lyconium. He's known by the church. Verse 3, Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. All right. Now we got us a problem. Paul took Timothy and circumcised him. Paul did not circumcise Titus. Why not? Titus had no so what? To our knowledge. The, the audience that they were going to to try to speak with because Timothy wouldn't have been able to go into the temple or anything to speak. Is this a double standard? If a person comes from a Jewish background uh, or partially, they're expected to be circumcised, but if not, they're not? I think um, to use today's term, it's called cultural awareness. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's the perfect term, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. Uh, is it wrong to drive a red car? Not in, this, not in this society. You might want to say where and when. Okay. What if everyone in a particular gang in Huntsville drove a red car? Would that make driving a red car sinful? No, but it brings up a good point. I was going up Jellicoe Mountain. Outlaw 7 as my tag. Uh -huh. Outlaw 7 was my call sign in Germany, so I had to get on home. Outlaw 7, you're talking 127 can be coming for a platoon, platoon sergeant. Uh, I'm coming up Jellicoe Mountain. I passed four outlaw biker gang members, and they were pointing at my license plate. Uh -huh. so, I was like, you know, I might want to change this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would it be culturally inadvisable to drive a red car if everybody who was a prostitute or a, a, a gang member or a, a pimp drove red cars in our town? <coughs> that would create a problem. If you park a red car out here in a parking lot of the church building and the elders came to you and said, we would prefer you drove another car to church, would, that, would they be acting inappropriately? Folks come by and say, well, look at the people over there at that church. No, there are some cultural issues that we have to be aware of, okay? Now, is driving a red car sinful in and of itself? No, it's not. Could, could any action taken in a specific culture or specific context have a problem in and of itself? Yeah, it could, and that's, that's where circumcision is here. Paul's going to argue circumcision doesn't mean anything. <coughs> uh, we've got at least two parallels that, that really work together here. Eating of meats, okay? When Paul argued eating of meat, both to uh, the Corinthians and the Romans, it looks like he goes in opposite direction some of the time. He doesn't, he's very consistent. If a person grew up believing that meat offered to an idol was a, something really dedicated to, devoted to this God, and then they became a Christian, and they shunned that because they thought that was wrong, and Paul says, you be sensitive to that. Now, meat's meat. It doesn't matter whether it's been offered to or not or not. It doesn't change the character of the meat. But Paul says, if you're with a brother and they tell you that that meat's been offered to an idol, 
Clearly it means something to them. He says, when you go down and eat with someone, ask no questions for conscience sake. Don't, don't ask where it came from, whether it came from the, the uh, family meat market or the idol meat market. It doesn't matter. There's nothing wrong with the meat, but it matters if someone is aware of it and it bothers them. So that's not hypocritical. That's sensitive to culture. So Paul is sensitive to the culture of Timothy. He doesn't want, this isn't for Paul's sake, this is for the benefit of Timothy. Paul didn't want Timothy rejected by those who knew that he came from a Greek family, or at least a half Greek family, and that he was not a circumcised male. Because the Jews, even the Jewish Christians, wouldn't have, it would have been a barrier for him. And Paul didn't want him to have that barrier. So Timothy he allowed to be, or caused to be circumcised, was that mean? Does this mean Paul was giving heed to the law of Moses? No? How no? The reason for the circumcision is different. He's giving heed to those who hold to the law of Moses. You see the distinction? That there, there's a big difference there. Paul is not doing this because of Timothy and his religious convictions. Paul is doing this because of the religious convictions of others who are going to come into contact with Timothy, and Paul doesn't want Timothy to be rejected. Does, does that mean he's playing into their biases and their weaknesses? That's exactly what it means, and that's consistently what Paul argued. We give help to who? The weaker brother, the person who does not have knowledge. You you. Defer to them so that you don't offend them. And Paul says, if eating meat will violate the conscience of my brother, I won't eat another bite of meat until the world, as long as the world stands. So does that mean our rights can be taken away by those who are weaker? Yes, it does. It means we submit to those who may not have an understanding. They yeah. are not taken away, we freely give them up. It, that's why I reworded that. Okay, well, let's... A good example. Uh, Short example. From the Parkway, yeah. there was uh, a young man who was converted, uh -huh. and he was, he always dressed very nice. He had long, curly hair, which was appropriate at the time. Very stylish. He was converted, and he was talking with someone at work, and uh, he was talking about his conversion. You a Christian? You don't look like one. That hair was gone the next day. He didn't have anything against hair. He thought it was right that because someone said, you don't look, you know, the way you look, how can you be a Christian? It was gone. <clears throat> he was also the one who said, uh, when talking about prayers, he said, are we supposed to pray like Jesus did? My prayers are generally microsecond calls for help. He was a great guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, indeed. And if you want to push that a little farther, is there an expectation for our actions and uh, behaviors and appearance to be perceived as consistent with Christianity? Yeah. So does that mean that there are some rights that we need to curtail that might not be perceived as appropriate of Christians to be a part of? Yes, indeed. But let's press on. We need to work in Galatians here. All right. By revelation, privately, uh, with those of standing, Titus was not uh, forced to be uh, circumcised, but Timothy was. Why? What did this... Uh, okay, well, skipped over one. Verse 5. To whom we did not yield submission... Even for an hour. Paul says, we didn't give in to these guys, not for a minute. That's how we would phrase it. Uh, so th there wasn't even a, a, a hint to this. Again, we're throwing out a whole lot of fodder here. Um, but rephrase that. We're, we're throwing a lot of chips from, uh, from our work. Um, there's no compromise on doctrinal issues. There can be compromise on other issues in our lives, but the, the right and wrong issues, there's no compromise for them. Now, 
we can have different judgments on viewpoints, and we can can argue strongly, um, emotionally about what constitutes right and wrong, and that discussion will take place often among uh, good, well-meaning brethren. But um, you don't give in to that which is wrong. This was a this was a right and wrong issue for Paul. Uh, now, when I say for Paul, I don't mean that it was for Paul alone, that it's his viewpoint and it's not consistent with the church. No, that I believe it is absolutely the right and wrong. That this was there was no other way to perceive this. The Jewish people who had been converted to Christianity had yet not come to grip with everything that involved giving up the law of Moses. It was it was hurting them. It was hard for them to do that. Paul recognized it. He was in the middle of it. And this is that transitional zone where there were some really difficult things for people to deal with. Quick comparison. How many of you know someone who grew up in a denomination of some sort and then was converted? And how difficult is it to let go of things that you learned in that denominational setting or practiced in a denominational setting that you come to find out are not supported in the scriptures. And, and that's, that's hard to let go of. Those are things that are ingrained in you and it's difficult to let go of that. And don't minimize the Jewish problem here. This was, this was tough on these folks. They had 1,500 years of following the law of Moses. And now, in a short period of time, relatively speaking, you've got this guy Jesus who pops up, and yeah, he does miracles and all kinds of things about him, and he claims to be the Messiah, or at least people around him claim he was the Messiah. They put him on the cross. They, they say he was raised from the dead, and now the preaching of the gospel begins, and so you hear about this, and you're convinced of it to some degree. You, you accept the fact that Jesus was special, clearly, and uh, over time, you're coming to accept the fact that Jesus represents a new covenant with God. But what does that do to the old covenant? What does that do to the way you've been raised? And what does that do to all the, the ceremonies that were done? What does it do to the temple? Paul will go back in Acts chapter 21 and, uh, and even go into the temple with, with guys going to be involved in the religious activities of the temple under the law of Moses. Well, that's when all this starts in Acts chapter 21. He gets caught up and then he addresses himself to the uh, the Jewish church, or excuse me, the, the Jewish people in Acts 22 and he's taken into custody and, and then we go from there. This is a big deal. It's easier for us to see now because we're not drawn by it. And we're not drawn by the emotions of it. We're not drawn by the past of it. But don't, don't judge these people too harshly. M many of them, okay, they, uh, there are probably a lot of obstinate people in that group. Paul was himself one of those. He had fought against Christianity before he fought for it. Now, sometimes in our politics world, and I just barely tolerate sometimes our political world, uh, for how hypocritical the, the actions are on both sides. I'll, I'll paint with a big brush here. Uh, and, and sometimes there'll be statements where people trying to win an argument and say, well, he used to be for it, now he's against it. Or he used to be against it, now he's for it. Okay. Well, rather than painting someone as a hypocrite, it may recognize the fact that there has been a change of mind and a re-evaluating of certain circumstances. That clearly, this is an issue where there can be a, a close position. And it's not way over here or way over here. But that it's right here and right here. And a little lean might make a difference. Don't, don't go crazy on folks like that. Paul was against Christianity. Now he's for Christianity. These people were struggling in a difficult time. Paul is trying to keep them from being pushed down the wrong path, trying to hold them up, but there's what, a lot of challenge. What about in today's world where you have, like, the Pope saying it's okay to bless same-sex relationships? And he says that you should not have an exhaustive moral analysis of yourself to be closer to God. That goes out all over the world. Yeah. 
Let me back up real quick to say what the Pope says makes zero difference to me. But isn't that a good example? I know, I know. It, 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 is, it is an interesting example that we have a person who purports to be head of a, a very large religious uh, organization under the name of Christianity who makes statements of this sort and the vicar of Christ <laughs> there, there's, there's layer after layer of issue that you know that comes up there uh, with a problem but yes it is a cultural issue and it is not one that can be easily pushed off there is a need for a serious conversation about gender issues widely and I say that uh, genuinely, even though I don't think that we need to change our views on what's right and wrong, I do think we need to change our views and how we interact with people who are in this world. And if our goal is to preach the gospel to every person, then we cannot walk down with a broad axe and take the head off of everybody who disagrees with us on gender issues regardless of how strongly or what their position is going to come up with. When Paul writes to the Corinthians and describes to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, and describes adulterers, idolaters, homosexual, and a variety of other things, and he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed and changed. Uh, these people were living in a world of very mixed sexual signals and lots of things that we would not think would be tolerated in a good society. Well, it wasn't a good society. It was a pagan society. Christianity was going to change that world to something else. But now we're seeing that world come back into the United States where we have not dealt with those things, and uh, or at least not so, so widely. And so we see a big change taking place there. And that conversation needs to happen. This isn't the time for it today. We need to move on, but um, that conversation needs to be happen. It needs to happen openly, honestly, and etc. Okay. To whom we did not yield, even for a moment. Uh, verse six: Those who seem to something, you know, there means nothing to me. <clears throat> Is Paul dissing the elders and apostles? Is he belittling them here? There is a, okay, the phrase that is sometimes used in our world is throwing shade, if you will. Uh, uh, is Paul throwing shade on these guys? Well, if someone was, was uh, felt themselves, if you saw the, the elders of the church of, of the church in uh, Jerusalem, oh, they're the elders. Uh, the apostles of, of Christ, oh, those are the apostles. And Paul says, Whoever they were, it doesn't matter. They stand before God, and, and the God doesn't show any favoritism. People are people. So that's the only thing Paul's doing, is, is don't be overwhelmed by the standing of these individuals as the apostles and the elders. Paul says, whoever they were, it was, it was Peter who did the. It was James, the Lord's brother. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who it was. Personality doesn't make any difference. Back in the day people used to argue, well, Guy in Wood says, and that was supposed to end all argument, that whatever guy, Brother Guy in Wood said, that just ended it. Well, Brother Guy in Woods was a great scholar and a great man, but uh, whatever he believed about some topic did not end all discussions. So, Paul says, it didn't end discussion. Uh, they gave it to me, uh, we did something else. Uh, well, we jumped over something in verse 4, we've got to, we've got to go back for it. This occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in to spy out, of, came in by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. Now that, that's the key right there. We ran past it a while ago, but that's the key right there. What's taking place? Okay. <clears throat> who are the false brethren? We don't know. Let, let's put them in a question mark right there. there that's a... That's a uh, a variable. If you had algebra in a while, uh, an a alpha 
character is put in the place of a number because it can represent any number. It is, what, what represents this? We don't know. Let's just see. We'll give that a number. N. Okay? Who are the false brethren? Well, what characteristics of the false brethren do we find here? Stay in verse 4. What, what clues can we get of who these false brethren were? Or at least characteristics of them? Jewish. What? They're Jewish. Hey, no, they're Jewish. Because they want to bring them back under the law of Moses. Okay, but. they are persons who want to influence folks to go to stay under the law. Okay? What else can we find out about them? Verse 4. This was not done uh, openly, but rather it was under the undercover. It was it was spying out. They came in secretly. These people slipped in as spies. It wasn't overt. It was covert. So they would have been pretending to be Christians, so they could get in and, and start. So you could get people to people there that were had been converted to listen to them. In what's, some ways. what's the difference in overt and covert? Over and open early is covert is concealed. What's the difference in overt and covert? C. C. One letter. <laughs> <laughs> One letter. The letter C. C for circumcised. <laughs> it works. <laughs> but a B. Okay, who's on the phone? I have had trouble sometimes with, with new Greek students understanding well th this is the same word well no it's not the same word it, in English you would understand overt and covert they're opposites well the words the C letter does not mean opposite if you put A anomaly or, or something like that in front of it that might, might be an opposite no, the C letter doesn't mean an opposite does it give me an example where C means the opposite Anything, any word. Over, over. Other than this. <laughs> Other than this. It, nowhere, nowhere, n nowhere that I know of. What's that? Over, over. No. Nowhere does the word, the, the adding of a letter C oh. change the meaning to the opposite. Okay, here's the significance. If they had come in overtly, out in the open, uh, it would be above board. But they came in covertly quietly without anyone knowing so Paul says these folks slipped into our church where at what church Antioch is where we're assuming what's taking place is, is still happening so they came into Antioch Antioch was a Gentile church uh, which had significant Jews there of a Gentile church and they came in because this Gentile church in Antioch was not following the law of Moses and so they came in quietly, covertly, to spy out our liberty. What is liberty? Freedom. Freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from the law of Moses. Okay, so Christians were freed from the law of Moses. Paul says they came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, our freedoms in Christ. We were not following the law of Moses. So that they might, what? Bring us back into slavery or bondage. Put us back under the law of Moses. Now that's what's going on here. Paul says these folks came in secretly to change the church and put us back under the law of Moses. Okay, now, question. Big question. Are these Christians who are wrong? Or are these Jews who are having the appearance of Christians. False brethren. What's false about them? Are they false in their beliefs or they're not really they're not really believers? While you're trying to decide how to answer that, let's go over to Second Peter chapter one for just a minute. And I heard the bell. And I know we're out of time. 2 Peter 2, 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who, who bought them 
and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways. Now, when Peter was talking about this, he said, you know, when we go back in history, there, there, were, there were false prophets all the way through the history of Israel. There were people who popped up and said things that God didn't say that claimed to be prophets. Give me a good example, quick. The old prophet, that's right, who tricked the young prophet and, and got him killed. He was a false prophet. But then God spoke to him and he became a true prophet. Because he prophesied truly to the young man at the dinner table, you're going to be dead because of what you did. False prophets, true prophets, false brethren, true brethren, false teachers, true teachers. We'll, we'll connect right there next week, Lord willing, and continue our discussion. Thank you.